um, I, I'm always wary of microphones because I have been told I don't often need one. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm talking today, uh, and really what I'm doing is actually reading from a book called The Pursuit, A Meditation on Happiness. Um, this project probably started 25 years ago when I was playing basketball with a, with a dean of mine at a small community college in northern Michigan in a town of 1,100 people. If you can imagine someone who grew up in Manhattan living in a town of 1,100 people surrounded uh, by four counties that were 85% state or federal forest land, um, you can imagine that I didn't quite fit in. Um, and we were playing basketball one day and I said something about happiness. And he said, who said you have the right to be happy? Which stuck with me, because we have this right in the Constitution, of course, to pursue happiness, which is a totally different thing. And so um, what I thought I would do is read passages from this, because the, the book is written in these very short sort of cascade of fragments uh, that try to mirror my thinking about the subject of happiness over the course of one evening. Um, and then I, I'll open it up for discussion. Um, I don't think I actually have any right to talk about happiness other than the fact that, in general, I think of myself as fairly happy. Oh, wait a minute, I have to do one important thing. Welcome to middle age. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy begins its entry on happiness this way. What is happiness? This question has no straightforward answer because the meaning of the question itself is unclear. What exactly is being asked? Seems as good a place to start as any. Or to riff on Raymond Carver, as many writers will, this book might as well be called what we talk about when we talk about happiness. Another look at the Stanford Encyclopedia suggests that we think of happiness in one of two ways, either as a state of mind or as a life that goes well for the person living it. Perhaps like light, it is simultaneously a wave and particle. Both are true, at least in how we conceive it in the West, in the fast-moving 21st century. We live in a time when technology makes our lives easier, and yet people seem unhappier. By unhappier, what do I mean? Less fulfilled, perhaps more despairing. Technology gives us more leisure time, but we seem to be toiling more, checking work emails, on vacation, taking care of some correspondence at home. We often spend leisure time on the internet. Social media makes it easier to compare our lives with the lives of others. And I put that in quotes because, you know, people curate the life that they show. And those of us who spend any time on social media have seen a link to an article detailing how time spent on Facebook and Instagram makes us less happy. In that, it leads us to compare our lives to the lives, the perceived lives of others. Among the writer friends I know, I often hear complaints about the number of rejections they've received while they see posts detailing their friends' acceptance letters and publications. It makes no difference that these writers who complain know that few people post about the 20-some odd rejection letters they've recently received. Despair and joy are not bound by what we know. They are mental and neurological activities, surely having to do with dopamine receptors, etc. none of which have to do with the intellectual neurological aspects of brain function. I am not a brain scientist. I'm not a philosopher, though I was a philosophy major. I am not probably all that qualified to talk about happiness because I may not be happy in many ways that people like to think about the term. I've felt, even recently, great envy, 
frustration, grief, loneliness, and more of what we would call the sadder emotions. But I will say too, without qualification, that I am happy. People who know me, and by that I mean people who may even be socially my friend, consider me a happy person. They may think other things of me. I'm sure some think I'm arrogant or insecure or even somewhat of an asshole. And I have no doubt that I can come off as each of these things and plenty of other things as well. Since this is not a study called on arrogance or on assholiness, my focus will remain on the numerous times I've been told by acquaintances from various aspects of my life that they think of me as happy. By this, I think they mean that I enact certain social graces we associate with happiness. I'm gregarious, quick to tell a joke or story, generous, sympathetic, I smile, I practice compassion, I tease myself and others, though I pay attention to not cross a line. I try to use discretion. Most important to this outward sense of happiness is that I laugh, often and out loud and without embarrassment. In the United States, we are obsessed with happiness. According to the most recent World Happiness Report, yes, that is a thing, from 2017, the U.S. population has experienced a reduced sense of happiness, dropping from 3rd to 19th in 10 years. No wonder there's an industry of self-help books and billion-dollar pharmaceutical businesses designed to lessen our pain, our depression, our anxiety. A sideshow of doctors has set up tents on television. They gladly tell us their secrets to being happy. They must be happy themselves, the way they smile with some smug assuredness that has everything to do with having a producer, a director, a makeup artist, a sponsor. Do what you love, they say. Look out for number one. Be mindful. Find God. Take a pill. Have one glass of wine a day. Join a 12-step program, a self-help group, a bowling league. Do what it takes. We have the right to pursue happiness. It's right there in the Constitution, after the rights of life and liberty. That doesn't mean we have the right to happiness just the right to pursue it. It's interesting language, isn't it? The right to pursue happiness, as if it were a rabbit to be tracked and trapped. We are Elmer Fudd, after the wascally wabbit. And like Bugs Bunny, it always seems to elude us. I don't know how many times I got what I thought would bring me happiness, only to have the rifle blast backfire. So, now a confession. Like so many things, it starts at a young age, our sense of happiness, our beliefs in what will make us happy. When I look back, I can think of the many things that added to my joy. See above, Looney Tunes. Also, I enjoyed riding my used Huffy and feeling cool air in my hair, my cheeks flush with October wind. I enjoyed playing with Lego and with the evil Knievel doll that rode a stunt, stunt motorcycle. I'd put him on the bike, put the bike on its charger, and then turn the crank till the motorcycle zoomed off. I'd build ramps from game boards for evil to get airborne. Sometimes imitating the daredevil on that Huffy is what did it. After a day of such play, I would lay each night in my mother's bed and read beside her, glad she was home finally from work. She would read too, and that sense of quiet togetherness filled an hour of my days with a little less loneliness, less anxiety about her absence. When she wasn't home, I laughed at cartoons or reruns of I Love Lucy and Happy Days. Like all children, I knew how to laugh. Ditto, like all children, I knew how to cry. My father wouldn't show up to take my brother and sister and me out on his required Sundays, off, no doubt, playing cards in the Brooklyn Club where Italian men smoked and anteed and raised the pot because they were holding an eight high straight. Left waiting, not used to such disappointment as I was the youngest by seven years, I would feel sad. 
Once, I got home from school and the door to the apartment had been jimmied. Something was jammed in the keyhole and I had to stay across the street with Tommy Tierney and his family. Call my mother. I spent the rest of the semester scared of a break-in. When I was nine, two 20-year-old neighborhood guys chased me down, pulled me into the tall weeds beside the Staten Island Rapid Transit line, and forced me at knife point to give them both blowjobs. I didn't even know the term for what I had to do. It was late summer, maybe a week or so before school would start. This was the 1970s, the city near bankruptcy. No one maintained the strip of land. The weeds were brown, tall as corn stalks. They were a great place to hide out for a few hours. We younger kids would go and tell dirty jokes and trade comic books, always leaving before dark. We'd see the remains of the older kids' nights there, beer bottles, cigarette butts. I remember being chased down. I couldn't pedal my beat-up bike fast enough. They dragged me to that place that had been a not-so-secret escape, the Huffy slumped by the street. After that day, I never went back. What was I to do right then? The knife blade there by my cheek. I got down on my knees, shaking. I lived with shame for decades. Despite this, I remained able to play, splashing in the Tierney's pool the rest of summer, sometimes. Laugh as I might, swim as I might. I could never rinse the stain of that time for me. Isolation is not about individuality. Isolation is a way of suffering. Caruso on his island feels miserable until he finds Friday. NASA worries about the effect of being alone in space without community when thinking about manned interplanetary missions. Solitary confinement is one of the harshest punishments of our criminal justice system. People trapped in cycles of shame, of guilt, often spend more time looking inwardly instead of their community. They believe no one will understand. Oedipus is vulnerable in his isolation and blindness, both real and metaphoric. Imagine him, hands flailing in front of him, knowing what he's done and believing everyone else knows it too. I spent much of my child alone, father gone, much older siblings with lives of their own, a mother who worked sometimes three jobs to ensure the bills got paid. But I was lucky. When my mother ran her errands, she took me with her almost always to the supermarket, to the cleaners, to pick up Avon, to the beauty parlor. I would pack some books with me to entertain myself, maybe one of those yes and no books with the yellow highlighter that revealed answers to trivia and puzzles, later a Mattel handheld football or baseball game. But for those hours in the passenger seat or of her car or walking together down a grocery store aisle, I wasn't alone. And even if I bore my shame with me, I was out, of the com I was out in the community of adults, one that seemed so much less hateful than the community of peers. Cool and the gang celebrate is now in my head. I am subject to earworms of all sorts. Celebrate is infectious. You all know that song, right? Celebrate good times, come on. Get it in your head, feel it. Celebrate is infectious, the funky bass line, the synthesizer rhythm with its major chords, those horns. It's hard not to want to dance, to sing along, to, well, celebrate and have a good time, come on, for a little bit. The holidays, as we approach them, are a time of celebration, and despite the rumor that more people commit suicide from Thanksgiving through the New Year, the Annenberg Center for Public Policy shows the statistics. The statistics don't match the myth. In fact, the suicide rates decline in these periods. The reasons are obvious. Despite the stress, the commercial cajoling for us to spend money that we often don't have, the engaging with relatives and friends and coworkers in situations that might make us uncomfortable, there's something good about celebrating. 
consider a Christmas carol. Scrooge is miserable despite his money, his self-isolation adding to his misery. Bob Cratchit, on the other hand, is happy despite his son's health, his family's woeful financial states. He struggles, but he's happy. He understands the importance of making merry. Happiness is about choosing to do what makes merry for you when you can. Cratchit might work long hours in miserable conditions for a surly miser, but it supplies him a means to be happy outside work. My mother used to take me on days off to see the Christmas display windows at the Manhattan department stores, even though we couldn't afford anything inside because the displays were startling. Animatronic figures, lights, landscapes of fake snow and glitter that seemed almost otherworldly and caused the viewer to wonder. Yearly, people drive for hours to see particularly decorated neighborhoods, the lights fighting off the early nights and the darkest days of the years in the Northern Hemisphere. That's what they're meant to do, fight the darkness, both internally and externally. In Jamaica, they say the want for a thing is more than it's worth. I used to hear my former girlfriend's mother say that often, including about Sherry and Mai's relationship. Wanting imbues the wanted with a kind of fetishistic value. How often did I see something I wanted and set about getting it only to be disappointed and to move on to the next wanting? I had to learn, of course, that wanting something comes with the responsibility of having it. Many parents with children who beg them for pets understand this. They see getting their child the wanted pet will teach the child responsibility. Our daughter will walk the dog. Our son will feed the cat and clean out the boxes. And what if the cat doesn't cuddle with the boy the way he'd hoped? What if the dog doesn't want to play fetch? The cat does what the cat does. The dog does what the dog does. The son, the daughter, still has to take care of the pet. As a child in the 70s, I would often see a little convertible roadster, be it a Fiat or a Triumph or an MG, and I would want it. They were sporty, zippy, and uncommon. When I had the opportunity in my mid-20s during a cancer scare to buy an MGB I saw in the field, I jumped on it. I had wanted one for two decades, after all. I was a city boy who'd known how to change a tire and change the oil of a car and had driven a ma manual transmission only a handful of times. Owning the car would require work. I'd have to learn to take care of it. To want something in the moment is often to ignore what the having entails. It can lead to a cycle of disappointment and more want. Our social media feeds, the various advertisements we see wherever we look, the new car the neighbor gets, all can make us keenly aware of what we don't have. The fact is, I, and I'm gonna guess most of you, live in abundance. The fact is, I have to remind myself of this. The fact is, there is much I'd like, but don't have. The fact is, I make decisions every day about what I can afford and what I can't. This makes me not like so many others in this country, in this world. Twice I've gone into credit counseling. I work two jobs sometimes and hustle at others to make money in other ways. Still, I give money to 80 to 90% of the homeless and panhandlers who approach me. I support various organizations and charities. I donate regularly to a literary arts organization to bring writers out. I promote punk rock shows in my home community, often guaranteeing bands with money out of pocket to ensure they come play where I live. I like to see my community come out. Each of these concerts and readings is a celebration. The bands and writers often stay at my house. What I've discovered is that inclusiveness, not exclusiveness, has brought more joy to me than anything I might buy. Even this emphasizes my privilege. 
and still happiness like a gaseous monster in a classic Star Trek episode maintains its elusiveness. Perhaps that's why we're given the right to pursue it as long as it doesn't hurt others. Like all pursuits, part of the joy should be in the activity. Many of the hunters I know, whether they hunt duck, deer, morel mushrooms, or the perfect landscape to photograph, tell me there's a thrill in the hunt that has nothing to do with the result. That's something Elmer Fudd never understood. My friend Dan would go out with the start of bow season to hunt whitetails. He'd leave early in the morning, just as dawn opened its eyelids, dressed in camo, and drive out to his secret spots. He loved the smell of the woods, particularly the mornings after a good rain, and he could talk for 15 minutes just about the morning sounds in the trees. More days than not, he never even saw a deer, and sometimes when he did, he didn't bag it. Those days weren't bad days. Those days were days of joy. Some people might blanch at this, ask how killing deer could be a joy. We get caught up sometimes in how others find their happiness. I could give all the arguments for why deer hunting is a good thing from deer popul population maintenance to my own enjoyment of venison. But this isn't that sort of book. Rather, this emphasizes how we get caught up in judging how other people find their happiness rather than focusing on our own choice to find ours. For some, it's in the yoga studio, the weight room, the kitchen, the church, or the woods. Find your bliss, the self-help books say. Judge not, lest you be judged, Jesus says. What is so amazing about judging people for what they do to make themselves happy is how much time and attention it takes from our own sense of happiness how much angst it causes. It distracts us from our own path to see someone on theirs. Consumer capitalism offers the solution, instant gratification, buy something to distract yourself. Yes, it'll give you a momentary rush of success, but when that fades, you need to take out your credit card again buy something else. Shopping can become an addiction, the search for that rush. I've known some die-hard shoppers, listen to them discuss the perfect find, and how a week later, they're out shopping again. Earlier, I said that in childhood, we form our belief in what will make us happy. It's this language now I wish I'd never learned. In consumerist cultures, people constantly look for what they can get that will bring them momentary pleasure, and we call it happiness, as if happiness can be delivered, as if it can be gift-wrapped. Thanks, Amazon. It was John Stuart Mill who discussed the different pleasures. How often did I think an object, a capacity, a person, a publication would change my fortune, make me happy? Worse, I've lived by a similar philosophy in my love life, thinking one lover or another, one partner or another could bring with them happiness. Of course not. Those relationships failed, often with a lot of pain to the other person and to myself. These things both add to my shame and are connected to it. How funny misery is self-perpetuating. My hurting of others surely shows how misery loves company. The fact is, I've often tried to protect those I loved, truly cared deeply about, and valued their joy from the very hurtful things I was doing. Sometimes a lie is designed to protect the self. Sometimes a lie is designed to protect the person we're lying to. Sometimes both. Non-duality. I learned to lie from my mother. I learned to lie from my father. I learned to lie to protect the hurt and scared self to hide from my own unhappiness. A scene that repeats from my childhood, riding in the car with my mother, she says, once we reach our destination, I'll be happy. I am confused because in those moments, I'm not unhappy. Antsy, perhaps. Bombed or frustrated because of doing something else I'd rather be doing, I'm out with my mother, but I'm not unhappy. No destination could make me happier, though some might lessen my frustration. Being in the passenger seat beside her, she who'd been at work so much, is the happiness. 
Sometimes people ask me about my Buddhist beliefs in American culture because the values of consumer capitalism and the values of Buddhism seem at odds. I might argue, but don't, that Christian beliefs in American culture also seem at odds. After all, the second noble truth is all desiring leads to suffering. And I have ambition for my work, for my students, for my friends, for my son. These people often say it snarkily. If you're so Zen, and yes, I've been asked this question in just those words on more than 10 occasions. Why do you care so much about your career? Feel free to erase career and fill in the blank with MGB or record collection or what publisher takes your next book. There is a difference, and this is key to my thinking about happiness, between aspiring and desiring. There is a difference between attachment, unattachment, and detachment. My aspirations are part of my happiness and a reminder of the suffering of desire. My ownership of things doesn't mean I don't recognize that I don't need them. If I didn't have them, if I suddenly had to sell the MG for some reason, I wouldn't be unhappy. It might cause me grief. I surely would miss it. I might be upset that I had to sell it for whatever reason, but the joy of driving with the top down, uh, but the joy of driving with the top down provides just that, a momentary joy. And joy is not happiness. Joy is momentary. Ditto sadness. I live fully in my moments of joy. I encourage every one of you to live fully in your moments of joy. That's why I laugh, why I sing some song I love when I hear it, even in the supermarket or at the gas pumps. Buddhism focuses on the fleeting nature of experience, of how we experience things, playing music, driving, talking to friends, playing a video game with my son, writing. All these bring gladness to me in moments. I try to make sure there are more of these moments than moments that bring me sadness. If sadness is the opposite of joy, what might be the opposite of happiness? I spent most of my life thinking about this. I used to think it was depression, but I've come to understand this as a clinical term. Sadness, perhaps, is a possible antonym. However, the more I think about it, I claim that the antithesis of happiness is anger. Like happiness, anger is a force for action. My old high school guidance counselor, Wendy Sands, used to suggest that sublimated anger leads to sadness. Maybe it does. Consider how good one feels after expressing their anger. This is the philosophy behind primal scream therapy. To release anger is often to be happier. Being frustrated to find joy makes me angry. Expressing freely my anger releases it and opens up the possibility for joy. Sadness offers no release. It is a limbo state. If only I could date, I'd be happy. If only I had, I'd be happy. If only I had, I'd be even happier. And if I had, I'd be really fucking happy. Doesn't matter how many times I filled in one of those blanks, none of it brought me happiness. Satisfied a want? Sure, but wants, as it turns out, are like planes waiting to land at the airport. One gets on the ground, and another is waiting for the runway to open up. That's not to say dating this person or having this thing didn't provide pleasures, though more often than not, what I found attractive about the person I wanted to date was connected to less attractive attributes that I hadn't seen because we weren't dating. They were part of their public selves, non-duality. 
Having an MG is great fun when I'm driving these mountain roads of Western Maryland. It's less fun when the car is on jack stands and I'm sliding under it on my back, the transmission and oil pan inches from my head. I've been under the car trying to figure out what's wrong with the speedometer angle drive. Or is it the parking brake assembly? Or is it just a routine oil change? The cement floor of the garage doesn't get comfortable over time. Or the car has broken down somewhere because the alternator stopped charging the battery, most likely because of something I forgot to do. Suddenly, I'm angry, frustrated, and pained. All of these things are natural reactions. I am not a mechanic, though when I taught at Kirtland Community College when I bought the MG, the school had an automotive lab, and there I learned a few things from the automotive teachers. Then I have a network of friends who are MG folks, who help me troubleshoot, who talk me down so I can re-envision the situation. This community makes me feel included, reassures me that the problems can be solved. It's good to walk away, do something else. The only thing I lose in those moments are a few hours, another day of driving, whatever. What I regain is perspective, insight, focus. It's good to remind myself of certain truths. If I want to drive the car, if I want to feel safe in it, I better do the job right. The pleasure comes with work. Because I'm no mechanic, it may take a while. Tomorrow or the next day, someday next week, I'll be driving again, top down, enjoying the moment, thoroughly pursuing happiness. Not fortunately today. Things don't bring happiness. Things are external. Things are outside the self. Another person, ditto. Our sports team winning, ditto. A better job, ditto. Some praise for work well done, ditto. Even this dinner, I can't wait. Uh, the course of this book, I was waiting for dinner to be delivered, um, which took three hours. Um, what is outside of us is just that, outside of us. We might subsume it or consume it, but it is not us. Happiness is some aspect of us. Friends I've known who've come out of the closet, even at the expense of familial relationships, have said they are much happier now, despite the sadness of having been estranged from their family, because they are finally living to satisfy the personal sense of who they are. The external approval of mom and dad may have avoided conflict, but it did little to make themselves happy. How often have I failed because I was worrying about disappointing someone in my life? How often have I failed because I resented those others and resented myself for giving into my fears and thus sabotaged myself? How often have I worried about image? Cowardice and shame are linked. I cheated on my ex-wife because I was unhappy, because I blamed her for my unhappiness when it came from within, but also because I was too scared of looking like a failure to end the marriage first. I was too scared of letting people down, including her. A contradiction, surely, but one that is echoed by the experience of many. Con conversations among the many I know who have done similar things, men and women, straight and gay alike, emphasize that this way of thinking is not uncommon. By giving up the belief my partner should make me happy, I've returned the power of my happiness to myself, and I can allow for my relationship to be a source of joy, pleasure, aggravation, frustration, disappointment, and surprise, without it ever being unhappy. Oh, let me check the time here. I'm going to stop there and open it up. I, I think that three things that I, that I think are key. One is this idea of aspiration. That if you are focused on what you're doing, not what the outcome is, you will be happier, significantly happier. The second thing is, is that then you're only answerable to you, not some external source. And the second thing is I think right now we live in an age where people are enraged. And if anger is the antithesis of happiness, then it's really hard to be happy 
And there are um, a lot of aspects of mainstream media that perpetuate rage, not perpetuate joy. And the third thing I think is that happiness ultimately is about how we live in a community. That the constitution and the right to pursue happiness is about the very nature of the community of the American experiment. That is to say that if all of us are pursuing our happiness, we're all in a better, spa better space. And that so much of what I see, and, and the reason I, part of the reason I wrote this book was about this idea that um, gestures of inclusiveness, of acknowledging that people find happiness in their own way, worshiping their own God, worshiping their own way, loving whomever they love, somehow takes away from our happiness if we don't worship the same way, love the same way, etc. And that's furthest from the truth. There's a passage that I didn't read about the war on Christmas. We, we hear about this. We're getting ready. I'm gearing up. I'm gearing up. It's October 15th. Christmas stuff's already out in Lowe's and Walmart. Uh, so that means we're going to have trick-or-treat, and then we're going to have the war on Christmas. It's coming. Because saying happy holidays is somehow a war on Christmas. Happy holidays, the, being told happy holidays is not a war on Christmas. Saying fuck your Christmas, that's a war on Christmas. Happy holidays, not a war on Christmas. Happy Holiday says, I don't know what you worship. Happy Holiday says, I don't know what you celebrate. Whatever it is, I want it to be happy for you. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Is it the blessing that you would prefer? No. Okay, I get that. If somebody like, came up to you in a mall, in a shopping mall, and gave you a, gave you a coin and it ended up being a Canadian loony, would you be like going hunting that person down and saying there's a war on the American dollar? No. There is, in the name of crass capitalism, a desire to keep us enraged. Why would you turn down, why would anybody turn down a blessing of happiness? Why? And what I've been focused on in the last five years of my life is focusing on all the blessings of happiness. Giving this talk, being invited here, was a gift. I could sit and go, oh, I got to drive, it's snowing or blah, blah. It's a gift. When somebody asks me, and they ask me often, because my primary way of being in the world is a poet, when people ask me if I will read their poems, I'm reminded that, yeah, it's work, it's everything else, and it's also an honorific. I appreciate your poems. I value your opinion. Would you do this for me? It's a blessing. We live at a strange time in this country. We live in a time in which we're being asked to be angry at our neighbors. Think about that. And for what? Who? is rewarded. In that. Happiness does not mean I'm not sad. I'm sad often. And sometimes I'm just like, nah. That doesn't mean I'm not happy. My, li my life is surrounded by the things that I've collected over the years. People, art, music, cats. Even when the cats annoy me, 
even when I'm like cleaning the box. Hate cleaning the box, love the cats. And so my, my takeaway, when people ask me about happiness, when they ask me to condense this, I say, happiness is the ocean on which I sail my boat. That's ultimately it. Happiness is the ocean on which you all sail your boats. Does it mean it's not going to be stormy? Oh, it's going to be stormy. Guaranteed, you're a human being. You, got, you, got, you, you deal with other human beings. Right? Sometimes you need the plumber and the plumber's not calling you back. You're in some rough water, literally. But it's also going to have periods of great smooth sailing. And if you just remember, as long as the boat's not going down, you'll be happy. I'll take some questions. That, that, that's what I'm going to leave it at. But now I'll take some questions. Well, I, I know, but you, you can ask me the questions anytime. There might be other people with questions. <laughs> Okay, what is your question? Okay, so you talk about in your book um, emotions such as grief, um, sadness, um, frustration, but you don't necessarily say that they are unhappy emotions. They're not. They're human emotions, right? There is no way to go through this experience that we call being human without grief. People you love are going to die. People you love are going to hurt you. Maybe not deliberately. They're going to break your heart. And then, they're gonna, then you're going to patch it together. And they're going to break it again. Like it's going to become like, like, the, uh, like a vase in, in like that's been like in, the, in a household of like young like children athletes, you know, where it gets glued together and stuff like that. We can't help it. We're going to get hurt. We're going we're gonna, to, you know. It's like, it's like sort of the thing like you can walk, you can learn how to walk without scraping your knees. But I want to say this, that all of those things, joy, grief, misery, heartache, despair, all of it is temporary. All of it is temporary. And if you have the resilience, which I think is, which is, resilience is one of the things we don't talk about, but if you have resilience and you feel like you have a purpose, uh, there's a whole part of this book in which I talk about Ernest Shackleton trapped with his men in the Antarctic Circle um, for over a year and nobody died. Think about that. Nobody died. because they all kept a sense of purpose. I think community is really important. I, th I think, and I, when I say that the pursuit of happiness is in, embedded into the American experiment, it's because the founding fathers understood that community is important. When we grieve, we want other people there. We reach out to our friends. And if we don't have friends, this is why isolation is so miserable. And this is why when we self-isolate, out of shame or grief or, or some other thing, it can feel like, like the boat's going down. Other thoughts, questions? I think happiness is the positive ion, or the, 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 the sort of positive side of a battery and anger is the other. It, we, we, you, it's really hard to not be angry. All right, uh, it's really hard to not be angry sometimes. Um, but, but you don't have to perpetuate rage. We all know the people who perpetuate rage. Um, right? Uh, you know, uh, my son's doing the dishes when he's younger and he, and he breaks a dish. I can be really pissed off, right? How can you be so clumsy? Boom, and I could, I could be angry for a minute. Nothing wrong with that. That's called a reaction. 
However, if I bring it up three days later, that's called something else. That's called like sociopathy, um, right? Which is to say, what's more important, the dish or my son's joy? We, 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 do, a, we do a program every summer. Um, we had a 22-year-old kid who volunteered for us on his drive back. He wrecked his car. And we had to go get him. We fetched him from a sidling hill. He had rolled his car. Car was totaled. He walked away with two scratches. Um, and finally, he said to me, uh, will you talk to my mother? And I said to her, if the car were fine and he weren't, how would you feel? And suddenly, the car became not an issue. She was angry about the car, and all she had to do was refocus on something, which was, had the car been OK, but he been totaled, she wouldn't be angry at all. She would be grief-stricken. I, I think that, that anger is unfortunately a part of the human experience, but there are people, um, uh, cynics, and I, uh, there are cynical people in the world and, and they have always existed, who um, rec recognize that anger is uh, as powerful a force as happiness, and it's a little, it's a little easier, and, and they manipulate that. You had a question. You can't put it on Google Maps. <laughs> is the joy. I, I'm a terrible Buddhist, by the way. I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm a better Buddhist than I was Roman Catholic. Um, but I'm not, I'm not concerned with my identity as a Buddhist, per se. Um, I'm not going to tell you the trick to happiness is mindfulness. It's not. Um, and, and if you read the Dalai Lama, or you, you, you read Thich Nhat Hanh, or you, you, you study with the, the Buddhist monks that, that taught me after I got thrown out of Catholic school as a high school student um, and would go to the Tibetan Center on Staten Island every day because my mother was like, the hell you're going to sit at home and watch I Love Lucy. But I was like, but it's the one with the chocolates. Um, um, they, feel, they feel anger, but they recognize it's passing. Uh, I can't sit lotus for half an hour. I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm not any of those things, I, but I do try to recognize that desire, like wanting an outcome. Like that's like the key thing. That's like my one Buddhist teaching. It's like the, the, one, the one Catholic teaching I, I maintain is that there's one commandment, love thy neighbor. Christians who are all caught up in like the Old Testament, I'm always like, um, Jesus, one, one commandment, love thy neighbor. Uh, I, I'm, I, I really focus on, like, the key tenet for me in Buddhism is desire leads to suffering. Aspiring, which is about how you go about doing the things you do. Not the end result, but the actual process by which you go about doing it. That's what I'm focused on. And that's, that's the path, right? The, the, whether you get the deer or not when you're in the woods, or the morel mushrooms for that matter, or, or whatever it is, being out, if you can recognize, wow, I'm out in this beautiful space at this beautiful time of year, 
even if it's miserable. Somebody's bow hunting in this weather. Think about that for a second. And loving it. That if you can say that's what this is about, then you're in a good space. If you can say, I, I once had a friend of mine say about her husband, sometimes I hate the son of a bitch, but I always love him. That's, that's the key right there, which is to say I could be frustrated or angry or 101 other things with the person I love, but the love is what's the value. And sometimes people confuse those things. I have in my life confused those things, that the anger was more valuable than the love. And I had to learn to give that up. And when I did, everything was better. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. So, when you first started talking, you talked about why are you have the right to be happy. When I think of rights, that, that means that there's someone or something or something that's giving you controlling me and my feeling is happiness is more my internal thing and then she said you know things that make other people angry they make you you know you may like like that they attack you over something that, that makes you think more about how to control a situation or position or whatever so. right I mean but but the the constitution I mean, it's in the Constitution, for better or worse, the right to pursue happiness. And I really think the Founding Fathers wanted to say, people are going to live their lives in this amazing place where we're all equal. And how they do it is up to them. Not, your, not the neighbor, not the pastor in the megachurch, not, you know, it's not anybody else. And we've lost sight of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure they can. Well, <laughs> Vote for me. Yes. Right. But, but if, if, we, if we accept that that is key, if we accept that Anybody, as long as, and I think the other, the other half of this is that anybody can pursue their happiness as long as they are not hurting somebody else. I, 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 you know, uh, a sociopath, a serial killer might be pursuing his or her happiness, but that's, you know, but they're hurting other people. You know, Kant, uh, Kant says that uh, you should never use somebody else as a means to an end. So you should never use somebody else to get to your own happiness, right? Um, but if we, if we think about what the goal was of that language in the Constitution, and it's language that is there and is, is important when we talk about rights, um, there is a lot of energy spent on people saying, how other people pursue their happiness is not like how I think is right to approve. To, and that is unfathomable. And it's done in a way to perpetuate and sustain anger. And that is done crassly to perpetuate and sustain donations. Oh yeah, and and I, you know, uh, and both sides of the aisle, two different degrees, both sides of the aisle. Uh, but I, I think that you know, for me, I, you know, you know, as someone who 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 lives in these various communities that intersect, um, I, I just try to say, enjoy yourself. You know, what what an, what an amazing thing to sit on a rainy. Wednesday night in this beautiful space and, and, and think about these ideas. That's a blessing.
Not something I'm bestowing upon you. That's just, that's, just, that's just a blessing in your life right now. And most of us, you know, many of us will be like, oh, yeah, I got to go grocery shopping on the way home or something like that. You got you to gotta, you gotta not worry about that. You're going to do it, whether we'll go 10 minutes over or 10 minutes under time. The grocery store is still going to be there, as it turns out. So anything else? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, not, uh, my mother, bless her, who, who is all over this book and, and who is my hero, my mother gets so caught up on things, uh, little things, ripped jeans. The idea that they are selling ripped jeans in department stores makes my mother angry. And when she gets angry, like, like we have talked about like showing up at Christmas, every one of us in ripped jeans, to, to sort of point out the like, absolute bizarreness that this is where your energy is. She has gone up to people, I'm not kidding, she's gone up to people like in malls, like, why are you wearing those ripped jeans? Um, I, and and uh, my mother has so much, my mother has so much love in her life. Um, my mother is a joy. My mother gets invited to uh, more birthdays, baptisms, weddings, um, you know, christenings, brisses, um, and she will go to every single one of them. And if you meet my mother and you tell her when your birthday is, she will remember and she will send you a card. My mother loses sight, certain things, she loses sight of her happiness. And I, I've tried talking to her about it. Um, uh, when this book came out, uh, my mother wrote me, she, she, she wrote me a letter, because my mother's never good at talking, um, uh, about, about something you know, she knew eventually. She knew my, when I was in my 20s, I talked to her about having, what happened to me when I was a child. Um, but she never realized, like, oh, you told me about it. I, I figured it was done. Um, you know, it took me a long time to figure out how shame works. Shame is the other thing, because shame is a thing that takes you out of community, and I think community is really important part of happiness. I think you have to live in the world of people. You have to. Um, yeah, they're, they smell funny, and, and some, some of them look funny. I mean, feet, just in general. But, um, but you, need, you need people to be happy. I, I, I believe that. You need, to live in, you need to live in the world. My mother totally describes herself as happy. But she, she loses sight of it. Um, and, and uh, you know, you know a, a over, over absurd things. Uh, uh, and, and I try to show her the absurdity of it and it doesn't, doesn't help. But I mean, but my mother is amazing. Like, I'm, I'm not saying it to pick on my mother because my mother is amazing. Um, and my mother did, you know, so when my mother wrote to me, she said, you know, uh, I, I, I should have been there more and blah, blah. My, mother's, my mother had one concern, which was, I live in New York City, I have three kids, and I have no help from their father. I got to keep a roof over their heads, clothes on their bodies, food in their bellies. And that's what my mother did. And I would never have told her to have done something differently. 